morning everyone it's lovely to have you all here with us and i hope that you're enjoying the lovely weekend that we've been having with all the good weather it's great to see you all who have we got online i can see malcolm and sue in chelsea you want to give us a wave malcolm and sue most enthusiastic that's <laughs> fantastic got jill sugar i think she's just switching a screen off in order not to wave or was that a wave jill that was a wave, definitely. Who else have we got? We got Rachel. Is that tea or coffee, Rachel? Coffee. <laughs> coffee. Good. Bless you all. It's great to have you with us. I'm going to hand straight over to Karen. And she's oh, going to share something concerning the children. And then it's going to come back to us and we're going to share some scripture. We're going to pray and then Pete will lead us in musical worship. And um, the next thing is next week, as we gather, we're going to be sharing communion together. And so I will put that out um, as expected on the Google group. But please do be prepared with bread and with why not an alternative substitute and we encourage you during that time as well and um, just to be able to put your cameras on because one of the things that Paul says in scripture is that when we meet together and we share communion together it's good to recognize the body of Christ and so it just gives us that sense of connectivity one with another and then the following week that's the 14th of February, you will know that it's Chris AK, Chris and Adelia's last week with us. So we're going to have a united service together. We know last time that a number of people were blocked off the call and we didn't realise that even when we put the two services together, we had a limit of 100 participants. We've increased that to 200. And so we are trusting that the two congregations come together and that will give us a really important opportunity to pray for Chris, Adelia and for the children and speak God's blessing over them for the future. So, Tracy. Morning again. Um, I was thinking earlier that, of course, we had Boris's announcement um, last Monday um, about the way out of lockdown and that there uh, was light at the end of the tunnel and um, we were all hopeful and lots of us were booking holidays and ready for the for the summer. Um, but I, in my mind, I'm still thinking, well, we've still got to get from here to there. Um, and I remember when Sam was little uh, and I would be at home with him, Gareth would be at work, that that last hour before Gareth came home was the longest. Um, and it's not to put a negative spin on it, but I think for us now, it's the time maybe to press in more um, with God and um, to just acknowledge him in our lives. And the fact that he's cared for us this past 11 months and that for the next coming year, um, you know, we still look to him for our comfort, our hope, our and his faithfulness towards us. Um, so I'm just going to read Psalm 34 um, from verse 8. And it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his godly people. For those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that as we trust in you, we lack no good thing. Lord, that's a fantastic passage. We worship you. And Lord, this morning, we just say together that we trust in you. We trust in you. We trust in you because you're faithful, because you're good, because you're generous, because you're kind. We trust in you because of your unchanging nature. Lord, we trust in you. And thank you, therefore, that we lack no good thing. Lord, be with us, minister to us as we minister one to another and minister to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Pete, who's going to lead us in song. Pete. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. I don't know if you can hear me, but give us a thumbs up if you can. You can. That's good. Thank you, Jim. Um, so this this first song we're going to sing. Uh, it's got a lot of promises um, from Romans in it. Um, we're going to have a bit of participation this morning. So there's a there's a, a call and response type thing going through the song. And if you keep your mics turned off, but respond on the in the call and response bits that would be good and hopefully we can join together and god will help us to worship him now and help me to stay in tune
Lord God, we do thank you that you move among us, and we pray, Lord, that you would move among us by your Spirit, Lord. We thank you that not being together physically isn't a barrier to you, Lord, and we pray that you breathe out your Spirit this morning. Amen. prayer Lord we we ask that you would help us Lord help us to pray you, you would breathe your breath of your spirit out on us Lord amen thank you there's a number of words that have just been texted on the chat to me and I just want to share them before um, opening God's word with you the first is from Lindsay and this is a personal testimony and one that I think is really special actually she said as she sat down with God last night she thought to herself a lot has gone wrong today and God just reminded her that a lot had gone right too and we need to be thankful in the way that we pray and I think that's a good reminder, not just for Lindsay. I think it's a good reminder for each and every one of us. And I want you to hear this next word. Um, it's from Neville. 
and it's a word that may resonate in many hearts this morning and Neville senses this that God is speaking you are more than your labels you are more than your qualifications you are more than your job you may think you are insignificant but that is a lie you may think your contribution hardly matters and that is a lie others may count you as nothing but it's not true you're in the family of god you're in the army of god your name is in the book of life your name is written upon his palms and i just want to encourage you to take a moment if you find yourself robbed of purpose so often if you believe the lie of the enemy just to realign your life right now through a conscious decision to what God speaks over you in his word. Just one more word that's been shared by Toby. Toby said that he senses that the Lord is saying that there is a window of time of great blessing and deep blessing available for all believers, but only those who press in and sacrifice their time with him will experience this. This is a time of being with him. Um, and a time where you can give to him your focus. It's not a time for doing and being busy, it, but it will be a time that's followed by a great outpouring of his spirit for those outside the church. And those who do not press in, Toby senses, will miss it and watch it from afar. Don't know about you, but I don't want to watch that from afar. Right now, I want to press into God because I believe that God has got a plan and a purpose for us. Amen. If you're in agreement, give an amen. Fantastic. We're going to be continuing right now with this little mini series that we're looking at called Always Hope. And if you remember, we've looked at Romans chapter five, where we saw that we have a certain hope. We looked at Romans chapter eight, as Joe led us through this eager hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. We looked at Romans 12, what it means to have a joyful hope. And today I'm going to be looking at Romans 15, verse 13, which is all about overflowing with hope. Again, I think that the prophetic is a wonderful thing. As we met before for prayer, someone had emailed Alan and said, Alan, I will not be at the prayer meeting this morning, but just so you know, I believe that God wants us to be overflowing with joy this morning and that is spoken of in this passage and so I want to read this passage to you it should come up on a powerpoint and we may refer to the powerpoint another couple of times because I want you to allow this word not just to be understood with your mind but to permeate and start to impact your heart so this is what Paul says I pray that God the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only short. I'm going to read it one more time. I pray, Paul says, that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you are not a football fan, I'm going to ask you, please, please, please do not tune off at this time. I want to share something which isn't actually specifically about football. I believe that the principles that I'm going to share are related to this passage. So to let you know that I had a really difficult upbringing, I was a Man City fan in a family full of Man United fans being raised in Greater Manchester in the 70s and the 80s. I was a really bitter football fan. I wouldn't wear anything that was red. I wouldn't sit on a red bike. I wouldn't even go on a family holiday if it meant missing a home game. And the real problem I had was that Man United were really good and Manchester City were really, really bad. Now at the start of every season, 
I always had hope. I thought this was the season where we would not be relegated or that we would, if we'd gone down the previous year, be promoted. But year after year after year, it felt that it just ended in disappointment. Now, you may know a few years ago, it turned to the better. And I've been reading the newspapers and I've been watching the telly and all of the pundits tell me that Man City have already won the league. It's already done. It's already dusted. But because of the past, I will not believe it until it's in mathematically impossible for us to blow it. You see, I think that that tells us that there are three kinds of hopes. First of all, there is a vain hope. It's a deep desire that something will happen, but a hope that so often leads to disappointment. Then there's a possible or a probable hope. It's more likely to happen than not, and yet it's certainly not a certainty. But I don't believe that Paul here or elsewhere speaks about those being representative of a Christian's hope. Because when Paul speaks about hope, he speaks about a sure and a certain hope, something that doesn't rob us of guarding ourselves, whereby we have to guard ourselves against the excitement in case it leads to disappointment. And so in the passage that we have read, what Paul does is he tells us the source of our hope. He tells us the means by which we can receive that hope and the expression that that hope takes in our life. And so I want to share those three things with you this morning. So firstly, the source of hope. In the Greek, Paul actually writes of the God of hope. It's almost a title that Paul attributes to God in the way that we read about the God of all comfort or the God of all peace. We realize that hope doesn't just come from God, but hope is always found in God. And because hope is always found in God, hope always eternally flows from him. Now, we need to remember that that one verse that I've read does not stand in glorious isolation, but it's part of an argument. It's part of a letter that Paul is writing to the church here in Rome. And if you logged in and were part of the service five weeks ago, you will remember what I said about this book of Romans, that if you understand this book, you understand the gospel. Because the book of Romans tells us about the righteousness of God, about the unrighteousness of humanity and the means that God provides in order that we can be made righteous with him and live righteously before others. Now, what Paul does time and time and time again is bring our attention back to Jesus because it's through Jesus that we made right before God. And therefore, it's the life of Jesus that God wants us to reveal to a watching world. And earlier on in this chapter, Paul reminds us again of Jesus. In verse four, we read that such things were written in scriptures to teach us long ago. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for these promises to be fulfilled. In fact, Paul he quotes from the
I think I'm back with you. If I'm back opportunity to go and get better me. But what speak says is still unstable. So we're gonna see what <laughs> what happens. But what I was saying is this, that Paul quotes four times these Old Testament scriptures because God has always done what and to when down in March dear, people start is hoping if hope scientists and trusting would offer a vaccine and medics trusting that they would bring their love government to an economic place people exercised in Get them through in one way. In you, in the can news to on which have doomed, and some of the some of the full hope. Some of one. And that hope is in his promise that never fails. What is the Do we receive it? Don't we? Be with us and remain. I'm just I'm with Katie, I can see you. Can you give me your... Don't think this is me, Tracy. Martin and Katie. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I well, you're okay you. now, Gareth, but it was it was very broken up for quite a long time. Sorry. So this is not a quiz, Martin. Where did I leave it? Well. <laughs> Uh, whoever's <laughs> editing today has got a very difficult job this will be seamless later on facebook nobody will know i've only had this problem once and it was last week at didcot now it looks as if i've got full internet strength here so there's little point in me moving actually so i do apologize about this so we've looked at god being the source of our hope and what I want to do, and I will be as brief as I can because of the problems, is just look at what this hope is and how we receive it. 
we have a hope that God will keep, as he has in the past, his every promise. We have a hope that his presence would be with us, that we would know his peace, that we would know his joy, that his spirit would remain with us. And again, that's not a vain or a possible or a probable hope. That's a sure and a certain hope. But we've already seen that we've got this hope for the future. Romans 8, Paul unpacks to us, even though we live through a time of suffering, as Caroline prayed, after earth comes heaven. And again, this is not a vain, a possible, a probable hope. This is a certain hope that we have in Jesus. So how then do we receive this hope? I wonder if we can just put the PowerPoint up again, because actually the answer to the question is in the text that we've just read. Romans 15. I pray that the God, that God, the source of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. And then you will overflow with confident hope by the power of the spirit. How do we receive this hope? We receive this hope as we trust in him. Now, I don't think that we should be surprised here because in this book, Paul has been teaching us that we're not made right with God because of our works. We made right with God because of his work, because of the finished work of Christ on Calvary. And therefore, we do not receive hope because we become the best Christians, because we give ourselves an hour to prayer or an hour to scripture. Now, all of those things are good. Please, please, please do not misunderstand me. But we receive this hope because we trust, because we receive from him. Tracy read this glorious psalm before the, as the service began, Psalm 34, that those who trust in him lack no good thing. And I just want to encourage you this morning, if you're lacking joy, if you're lacking peace, as you trust in him, in his provision, in his promises, in his goodness, in his faithfulness, then you will overflow with hope. So what does it mean? What's it look like in practice to overflow with hope? Tracy and I live about 400 metres from the River Thames, and we've seen over the years that as we go through a dry period, the level of the water starts to drop. And then when we go through a rainy period, the level of the water starts to rise. And what we saw a couple of weeks ago is that the Thames completely broke its banks. It overflowed because there was so much water pouring in. There was so much water just had to pour out. And so when we cease to trust in God, it's as if our hope starts to diminish. It's as if the water level starts to drop. But as we start to trust and there is that overflow of his heart into our heart, then hope starts to rise in such a way that it invariably, inevitably overflows. We overflow with joy. Now, please don't get me wrong. Joy is not the same as happiness. Happiness is so often dependent upon something that happens external to us, something that happens around us. But the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, is that joy that we have in him, which is not dependent upon other situations or circumstances. It's a joy that says that all is well with my soul. It's because we've been captivated by a beauty that's greater than any ugliness that this world can serve up to us. Peace. Peace is not the same as being carefree. 
it's not being ambivalent about the suffering of the world in which we live. It's not being naive, but peace is an assurance that whatever those situations or circumstances may be, that God still, in his goodness, in his sovereignty, can work all things for his good and for his glory. And so I just want to leave you having looked at the source of joy, having looked at the means by which we receive joy, I want to leave you with, again, just understanding how this joy overflows in our life. It overflows by the power and in the power of the Spirit. Now, if I were to go to the Thames with a glass and take a scoop, what I would get is Thames water. What would overflow from the glass is exactly what I put into it. But if I get the same glass and I pour into it mineral water, what overflows is what's put in. Not something that's dirty or skanky or muddy, but something that's fresh and clean and life-giving. Paul speaks in Ephesians chapter 5 about being filled with the spirit. He speaks there in the present continuous tense. Paul is saying that we're not filled once, but we continue to be filled, present continuous tense, by the spirit in order that what God pours into us is what flows out of us, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. God wants to fill us afresh with his spirit this morning in order that what comes in is just that which is poured out. Now, where do we see this best demonstrated? We see this demonstrated in the life of godly men and women, some we know and some of whom have gone before us. But we see it most perfectly revealed in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You will know that I've spoken and written on this in the past about Jesus' relationship with the Spirit. I love the fact that at his baptism, we discover that the Spirit descended upon him like a dove, it rested, and John says, remained upon him. And so we find that Jesus continued to be led by the Spirit, anointed, empowered by him. Of course, it was the Spirit that led Jesus to the wilderness. And ultimately, it was the Spirit that led Jesus to the cross. And there we see the faithfulness of God. There we see the goodness of of God. There we see ultimately where every promise is fulfilled because our sin is placed on him in order that we might receive his righteousness. Our guilt is placed on him in order that we would know his forgiveness. Our weakness is placed on him in order that we could receive his strength. Our hopelessness is taken by him in order that this morning we would receive his hope. The cross stands for you and for me as a testimony of God's commitment, of God's love, of God's grace, of God's provision. And so I want to encourage you this morning to do as Paul has encouraged us to trust in him. Tracy saw or spoke earlier about the last hour. And if you find yourself counting down the minutes, counting down the hours, continue to trust in him. If you find yourself in a place of darkness and despair, continue to trust in him. If you find yourself hurt by things that people have spoken over you, if you find yourself struggling with unforgiveness, continue to place your trust in him. Because God's plan and God's purpose is this, that as you do so, as I do so, we would receive his peace. We would receive his joy and that we would overflow with his hope. Just going to ask you just to be still in the Lord's presence. 
You might want to close your eyes. You might want to just lift your hands. I'm going to continue to watch. I don't drop out of the internet. But just want to encourage you to think of some of the things that have been prayed this morning. Some of the words that have been spoken. Some of the things that we've discovered in this glorious passage. Just allow the spirit of God just to bring some of those again to your heart and mind. Some might be an encouragement, some might be a challenge, some might come as conviction. But I want to ask you where God speaks to you. Make a decision, a conscious decision. Lord, I trust in you. God doesn't give us a vain hope. He doesn't ask us to hope in something that's possible or probable. But Peter says he gives us a sure and certain hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As you exercise your trust, your faith in him, allow God to pour hope in your life that expresses itself in joy and peace in Jesus' name.